an American child. Yes, it does seem strange once you think of it. It's rather like giving birth to a stranger somehow. <laughs> uh, no, 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 but look at it this way now. I'm an Englishman. I was born in England and I grew up there. I feel English. All my memories are of England and when I go to bed at night I, I dream of England. Not Massachusetts colony. But when this son of mine grows up, why, he won't even know the sort of dreams I've had. All he'll remember are the dark forests of New England. He'll dream of six-foot snows and peacock Indians and tales of Thomas Martin running rings of and Miles Standish. <laughs> he'll be having American dreams, Mr. Cotton. When I'm still dozing and seeing the spires of Dilly Cathedral. Very strange. I can tell you. I suppose that's our lot, Mr. Brackett. We set at a new country here in this wilderness, and as long as Mrs. Hutchinson in there carries on with her midwifery, we'll have a new grand crop of Americans before we know where we are. There, you see? She's an amazing woman now, Mrs. Hutchinson, isn't she? Yes, sir. I don't know how anyone got born before she came here. Hawkins is a good old soul, but uh, between you and me, I think she hinders rather than helps the good Lord in his handiwork. <laughs> Anne Hutchinson is something special. I don't mean all those books she keeps poring over. She's tough and strong and practical. When she attends a woman in childbirth, she seems to be really in partnership with God, assisting him in the delivery of one of his new souls. Anne Hutchinson is a good woman. You must never forget that. No matter what happened. I do wish she'd learned to. What? There you are, Mr. Brackett. You have a fine, big American son. <sighs> He sniffs a bit and he looks a bit blue for the moment, so you pick up in no time. Oh, Mrs. Hutchinson, I don't know. <laughs> you go and thank your wife. She's done all the work. Yes, but what we've been saying, I don't know. We managed in Boston without you. Why, you're a nurse and midwife to the old colony. And what would that 14 of her own children? You would think she'd have a little time left for them. Pay the gratitude for God. Well, well, now, Mr. Cotton, it's good of you. Keep our new father occupied. Or is that why you came? Oh, you are a puzzle, Mrs. Hudson. How do you mean? Well, you're a nurse and physician to the whole colony, and you sit up half the night over some biblical commentary, yet you're up at the crack of dawn feeding a score of hungry mouths. And after working your hands to the bone for everyone else, you go to church, where you shout your head off about the uselessness of good works. You're a walking contradiction. It delights me to see a new child walk forth under my hand in there. But I'm not going to buy God's favor. But if God's favor can't be bought. He gives his grace of his own free will. Nothing we can do or say will affect the outcome. Mr. Wilson and his lot behave well. Certainly. They do good works. But they do them in a calculated spirit. Without pleasure. Without kindness, sometimes I think without love. And they want something back for each one of them. And don't you hope that your work in this world will stand you in good stead in the next? I do not. Surely decent behavior must yield some sort of spiritual credit. Mr. Cotton, it mortifies me to think that you, you of all people, should talk of credit. God is not a... A grocer doling out grace to thrifty customers. God is a, an absolute mystery and cannot be wrapped round our fingers with good works. Are you beginning to be of their persuasion? I'm disturbed by the breach that is widening. Well, Mr. Cotton, can the breach in our church be sealed by a tyranny? You go, sir. You go so far as to call your ordained ministers tyrants? 
when they will not give us a free conscience in this matter than they do rule by tyranny. I do not want to rule. I want to be free to follow whatever inspiration God gives me by his grace. I've heard you say yourself that for a man who hasn't the spirit of God within, even the New Testament is as dead as a doornail. And listen to me. We are in a wilderness. If everyone followed the dictates of his own inspiration, there would be a hundred sources of authority, and the whole colony would fail. We're hanging on here by our fingernails as it is. Only last week, Mr. Oldham was found dead in his boat with his hands and feet hacked off. If the tribes of the Narragansetts and the Pequots should join forces, we should all be pushed into the sea. And you know what Archbishop Lord's response would be to our falling out amongst ourselves. We have King Charles station a garrison here. And before you could turn around, there'd be half a dozen bishops watching our every move. That's what we came here to get away from. I know. I know. But do you not hear the change in your voice? You're no longer speaking of spiritual values. Anne, you cannot threaten the harmony of the group while we are fighting for our very lives. Governor Winthrop will act to preserve that harmony. It is his obligation to do so. One more thing. Yes. I know that you have been having discussion groups here in your home, apart from the church. The church does not forbid discussion. In the circumstances, it suggests further dissension. I would discontinue them for the time being. Mr. Cotton, I know you mean well. But I don't know that I can temporize with matters of conscience. Expediency is all very well, but if you lose your soul in the process, where is the expediency? Nevertheless, I promise you, I will think over what you have said. I'm a reasonable woman too, Mr. Cotton. And be more than careful for the security of this colony. Be careful for your own safety. Stocks have a certain advantage with regard to position, but then it has what I would call basic disadvantages, mainly with regard to weather. Now, these stocks are very badly placed when it comes to weather. <laughs> I have thought and I have prayed. John Wheeler Wright, we do need you as our preacher. If, however, the governor will not allow us to hear you in Boston, we must abide by that decision. But in that case, we must hear you somewhere else. If there is work to be done for the Lord, then I shall do it willingly. Where do you think it best I preach? I had thought at Mount Wollaston. That is near enough for us all. To attend. That may be true, Anne. But a minister can be punished for dissension just as well in Mount Wollaston as he could if he preached right here in Boston. Roger Williams made his stand in Salem, but he got pushed out all the same. Yet we have more followers than ever poor Roger Williams had. My hope is that the governor will be impressed by the numbers we shall attract to Wollaston. Do we know we have such support? Six months ago, we had a governor who believed as we do. One blast from the minister, and he was then packing his bags for England. Now we have Mr. Winthrop. And I think he's hand in glove with Wilson. Mr. Trencher, you're faint-hearted. The election of Governor Winthrop was a narrow business. 
He had so little support here in Boston, they had to slip him across the river to Cambridge to curry favor and win votes. We may be a few...